Welcome to the 6.1 to 6.2 quiz review. Here we will look at the following skills. So we want to convert between log and exponential form, talk about natural log, know how to evaluate logs, find the inverse of both types of functions, understand how to find the domain of logarithmic functions, and then 6.2 properties of logs. Your quiz will really be mainly over 6.1 since there's a lot more going on there. Out of nine problems, seven of them are from 6.1 and only two of them are from 6.2 properties of logs. Let's take a look at the problems. Here's numbers one and two. Three and four. and then five and six. Here are all of the worked out solutions and the explanations for our six problems. In problem one, we wanna write in the opposite form of what it's already been put in. So part A is written in exponential form, so we wanna rewrite that in logarithmic form. So for part A, we have the log, and then our base here is x, so the log base x of w equals the exponent. Remember a log always equals the exponent. In part b, we are already given this equation in logarithmic form, so we want to convert it back to exponential form. Well, because it's natural log, our base is e, even though we don't see it. So our base is e, and remember logs are always equal to what the exponent is, so here our exponent is y and it's equal to x. In part c, this expression, or equation rather, is written in exponential form, and so we want to rewrite it in logarithmic form. Our base is 10, so we have log base 10, but we don't need to write the 10, because with a log, L-O-G log, we assume a base of 10, just like with natural log in part b, we know the base is e. So log base 10 of y equals the exponent x. So here's our three written in the opposite form going between logarithmic and exponential form. In problem number two, we wanna evaluate each logarithm. So in part A, we have the natural log of e and we wanna know what that equals. So our thought process is the base is e here, even though we don't see it, it's down here. So we're thinking e to the what gives us e. Well, e to the first will give us e. Therefore, our answer to part a is 1. In part b, we have log base 3 of 1 over 81, and we're looking for what that equals. So our thought process is 3 to the what gives us 1 over 81. So here's our thought bubble. Well, I know that 3 to the 4th gives us 81, but we want 1 over 81. Therefore, 3 to the negative 4th will flip it and give us 1 over 81. Therefore, our answer is negative 4. And in part C, we have log base 49 of 7, and we want to know what that equals. So our thought process, since we're looking for an exponent, is 49 to the what gives us 7. Well, in this case, we were getting smaller. We were here too getting smaller, but in this case, we're not getting to a fraction really. So we are thinking, well, 49, how do we get from 49 to 7? We need to take the square root of 49. We know that 49 under a square root so here's a little 2 because it's a square root, and then we're raising it to the first. That gives us 7. Therefore, 49 to the 1 half power equals 7 because a square root means a 1 half power. So the answer here is 1 half. Part A is 1, part B is negative 4, and part C is 1 half. In problem 3, we want to find the domain of each logarithmic function. No matter if we have a log or natural log, what goes inside of it must be positive. So in part A and in part B, we have to force what's inside of our log function, 2x plus 8, to be positive, greater than 0. 
from here, since it's just a linear inequality we just solve, we don't have to flip the inequality because we didn't multiply or divide both sides by a negative. So our solution is that x needs to be greater than negative 4. To write that as an inequality, or rather an interval notation, it's from negative 4 to infinity, and we can't include negative 4 because that would make what's inside 0, and it has to be greater than 0. In part b, we want to do the same thing, but part b is a quadratic on the inside. So again, we want to force what is being input into our natural log function to be positive. And since it's a quadratic, we can factor, well, because it's a factorable quadratic specifically, and because it's more difficult to solve when we have multiplication of factors, what we can do is make a sign chart. Our two values that make these each equal to 0 are negative 3 and positive 3. Therefore, on our sign chart, we go to negative 3 and positive 3. These are the x values, and above we want to see what the sign is at each one of these. We know what happens when we plug in negative 3 or 3. We get 0 if we plug that into here or here. Regular form or factored form either way gives us 0. But we want to know what happens to the left, in between, and to the right. So plugging in a number less than negative 3, we can plug in negative 4. When we plug in negative 4, you can plug it in up here or in factored form. Doesn't matter. If you plug it into here, we'll have negative 4 plus 3, that's a negative number, times negative 4 minus 3, that's another negative number. A negative times a negative is a positive. If you plugged negative 4 up here, you'd get 16 minus 9, a positive number. Either way, it works. Plugging in a number in between here, we can plug in 0. Plugging in 0 for x will have a positive times a negative. And plugging in 0 up here will also get a negative out. So either way, we'll have a negative output. And then plugging in a number to the right of 3, we can plug in a number such as 4. If we plug in the number 4, we'll have a positive times a positive, which is a positive output. That's telling us that when we plug in certain x values that are less than negative 3 or greater than 3, this right here is guaranteed positive. If we plug in numbers in between negative 3 and 3, this here ends up being negative. So we need to plug in numbers that are in the intervals that give us positive output since that's what we want. So our domain is negative infinity to negative 3, union 3 to infinity. You can always test it out and see if we plugged in a number in between here, like the number 2, we would definitely be negative here. 2 squared minus 9 is a negative number. Anything in these intervals here, though, ends up working and gives us a positive output. In problem 4, we want to find each inverse. In part a, we start with an exponential function, so I'm going to just replace f of x with y. I haven't found the inverse yet. To find the inverse, recall that we swap x and y, so we'll have x equals 10 to the 2y minus 3. Once we have something in exponential form, an equation in exponential form, in order to get the y by itself now because it's up in the exponent, we can change it to logarithmic form. Logarithmic form will be log and then base 10, so we don't need to write it, of x, you can put the x in parentheses, equals our exponent, which is 2y minus 3. Remember, a log always equals the exponent. Now from here we want to solve for y, so we can add 3, and the 3 is on the outside of the log, and then divide by 2. So dividing by 2 can just put the 1 half out in front of this whole thing. Or an alternate way to write this is that y equals, and then like it can all be over 2, or we can just distribute the, the 1 half through the divided by 2 and write it like this. So either way is fine. Uh, you could have also written it as this over 2. In part b, we're starting with the logarithmic form of our equation, and we want to get it equal to an exponential uh, form, basically, to find the inverse, because exponential and logarithmic equations or functions are inverses of one another. So once again, I'm just going to replace f of x with y. I haven't done any swapping yet to find the inverse. Now to find the inverse, we will swap x and y. And then I want to get the plus 3 over to move that, so the natural log of y is just by itself. 
Now, in order to get y out of that natural log, what we can do is convert from logarithmic form to exponential form. Our base here is e because it's a natural log. So it's e to the x plus 3. Logs are always equal to what the exponent is, equals y. And I didn't do this in part a, but instead of y, we can write it as f inverse. equals e to the x plus 3. Down here, we can rewrite, instead of y equals, we can rewrite it as f inverse equals. I personally like having the 1 half out in front, but either one is fine. In number 5, we want to expand each logarithmic expression and simplify each term if possible. So these are using the properties of logs. The properties of logs include product, quotient, and power power properties. Um, and so in part A, we actually are using all three. The first thing we can do in part A is bring this four out front. That's the power property that says if we have a power or exponent, it can go out front and be multiplied by the log. So we have four log base two of three A over 16. Now, because we have we actually have um, definitely a quotient in here, but we also have a product in 3 times a. So what I'm going to do is expand that, and the 4 is going to stay out front of all of them because it's multiplied by this whole thing. So we're going to have log base 2 of 3a minus log base 2 of 16. And that's because we have a quotient in here. We have the log of u over v, and that can be rewritten as the log of u minus the log of v. Of course, the base stays in every single one, so we have a base of 2. This was our numerator, and this was our denominator. Now, the 3a is also a product, so we can actually expand that into a sum of two logs. So we have log base 2 of 3 plus log base 2 of a, because the product property for logs tells us that if we have the log of u times v, we can rewrite it as the log of u plus the log of v. Again, the base of 2 stays consistent. Then we still had minus two, log base 2 of 16. However, what is log base 2 of 16? This can, this can be simplified. 2 to the what gives us 16? 2 to the 4. So log base 2 of 16 is really 4. Now from here, we want to see if we can simplify anything else, any individual term. Log base 2 of 3 is not anything that I'm aware of. 2 to the what gives us 3, some decimal, so that's harder to simplify. And log base 2 of a cannot be simplified because we don't know what a is. So we can either leave it like this with the 4 out front, or we can expand and uh, multiply the 4 by all of our terms. So we have 4 log base 2 of 3 plus 4 log base 2 of a minus 16. In part b, we again want to expand. And this one is not as complicated. I probably should have started with this one. So we have the log of 100 times x. And so we have the a product in here. And so that can be rewritten as log of 100 plus log of x. Because our base is 10, Log of 100 is 2, because 10 to the second is 100. So we have 2 plus log x. And that is as simplified as we can get for part b. In number 6, we want to condense and essentially do the opposite as in number 5. And we want to write these as a single logarithm. So they've already been expanded. Now we can use those properties in a backwards way to condense and write as one log. So we're definitely going to have it as log base 3, since the base doesn't change. And we see that we have two logs being added to one another. Well, the, we have the log of u plus the log of v, which can be rewritten as the log of u times v, according to the product rule, or product property, rather, of logs. So we want to multiply these two. So we'll have x times x plus 2. To simplify that, we'll distribute through. So we'll have log base 3 of x squared plus 2x. And we have successfully written that as one single log. In part b, we again want to condense and write as a single log. We see that we have a 2 out in front here of this first term, so that means that 2 can actually go up 
next to the x. So we're going to have the natural log of x squared. That's working the power rule or power uh, property of logarithms backwards. And then minus the natural log of y. Now we have two logs still. They haven't been written as a single log. So since we can write this as a single log, it's going to be natural log. And since these two are being subtracted, that means that they were initially one quotient. So we're going to have the natural log of x squared over y. The quotient property says that when we have the log of u over v, it can be rewritten as a log of u minus the log of v. Natural log still works, it's just a type of log. And in this case, we had the log of u minus the log of v, so working backwards, we can write it as a quotient. So that is how we can condense that into a single logarithm. Up next are the quick solutions so you can check your work. Here are all the solutions condensed onto a single page. Uh, please note that in number four, some of your answers might look slightly different, like this one half could have been distributed through. Uh, that's really the only difference there. Or you could have written it all over two. Either way is fine. These types of problems will be multiple choice, so they might look a few different ways, just depending on uh, the answer choices. The rest of them should look just as is. Best of luck on your quiz, and hope you did well on the review.